from their body. From there. Mm. Okay. So hello everybody. Um, today we'll be presenting globalization. So what is, what is globalization? According to IB and Monica G slide, um, globalization is a process by which the world's local, national, regional economies, societies, and cultures are becoming in increasingly integrated and connected. Basically, what it means is that the communities and societies, basically the whole globe, is becoming more connected, more integrated due to um, the lessening of world barriers. Now, uh, many people argue that the globalization started in the 14th century and the 15th century um, by our beloved colonizers. But um, the first wave of colonization also came um, in the 1800s with the, with the um, trade of gold. Um, but where it essentially stems from um, is um, the theory of um, liberalism, um, which um, on an individual scale is um, protecting and enhancing the freedom um, of individuals. Um, but in a trade sense, it's the removal and reduction of restrictions or barriers on the free exchange of goods between nations. Now, it's, it's seen as a good thing because um, the world has become more interconnected, everybody has more options, um, and it's related to the theory of capitalism as well, um, which is um, basically an economic system where private actors own um, the property, and the main um, essential aim is to generate profit. Now, this is often con um, contrasted with the theory of socialism, uh, which calls for public rather than private ownership, and um, that everybody works um, in a social manner, and every product that one creates is, um, a pro is, a, is contribution to a larger uh, product um, in a whole. So, so it started with economic um, globalization, as I mentioned, um, due to um, more and more interconnectedness due to technology. Um, th there has been different kinds of globalization, um, such as political, environmental, and social. Um, I'll, I'll give a brief of these um, types. Um, political, as I mentioned, is the um, interconnectedness of global, uh, global economies. Um, and the trade and exchange uh, of resources. Um, political globalization is the cooperation between different states um, for, for larger issues as a whole. Um, the good example for this may be the UN World Trade Organization and so on. Um, social um, globalization has recently started because of the um, rise in technological, um, technological services. Um, it refers to the cultural um, sharing of ideas and inf information. Um, and finally, environmental um, refers to the internationally coordinated practices for our environment, um, which sort of everybody is seen as a stakeholder in. Now, um, as I mentioned, uh, the liberaliz liberalization of um, trade or like globalization is mostly seen as a good thing because um, there is greater opportunities, there are greater choices for consumers, and there is trade between nations for which a country can accommodate its lack of resources in. But in a way, it also creates inequalities among countries. Now, um, I, I like to bring the world um, system theory here, um, wherein there are core um, countries and there are periphery countries. Now, due to, due to the inequality, the periphery countries mostly um, export the, the raw materials or uh, materials which require um, comparatively low skilled labor. And the core countries um, export um, resources which are primarily high skilled labor. Now this creates an inequality among states because the, the, um, the exportation by um, the periphery countries are lower in revenue, whereas it's the opposite for the core countries. Um, this is just an example of economic uh, globalization, but for different kinds of um, globalization, there are different kinds of inequalities. For example, global political um, uh, connection sort of undermines the sovereignty of certain nations. Um, the cultural um, 
globalization influences different states, which we read um, in our first term in the soft power um, concept. Uh, similarly, the environmental uh, globalization also creates an inequality between um, states who are actually um, able to give back, um, who are actually able to provide for the environmental factors, and those who are not. Um, continuing with this presentation, we have Akeem. <clears throat> okay, so when we talk about economic globalization, we are talking about the interdependence um, that countries have of each other economically. This refers to the exchange of resources that country um, maintains globally and annually. So when we talk about yeah, economic globalization, we bring up different points. First of all, the growing scale of cross-border trade. This means that the trade between countries will be more open and there will be an international market in which, will in which countries will, um, relation between, uh, will have relations between each other and in which they can exchange economic resources. Secondly, we have the flow of international capital. This is what I was talking about when I said the exchange of economic resources. Since this will generate a flow between countries that will be um, will be ma maintaining and obtaining re economical resources and also giving up resources. Countries have different types of, of production and they, they produce um, different economic, reso um, economic resources. For example, Argentina produces um, really good agricultural resources to exchange economically. Um, for example, industrial resources produced um, by UK. Um, finally, we can bring up the wide and rapid spread of technologies. Since economic, uh, economic um, globalization brings, brings up um, a uh, revolutionary way of countries um, connecting. And this revolutionary way is seen in the revolution of technologies in all fields. In the industrial fields, by exchanging knowledge to um, solve how to make certain um, machine to the medical field. Um, for example, um, COVID vaccines are, are, are produced of these since um, th thanks to the interconnected um, parts of countries, um, this, this medical resource could be produced. This is studied at a global um, level of, yeah, at the global level in, in Globo, since when we talk about economic globalization, we are talking about the interaction of all countries as a whole in one de determined, um, in one determined international market. Um, this is related with, first of all, development concept. As we talk, um, as we talked before, there are different types of development. One is economic development, and we determined that that was one of the most important developments, also with social development. Um, so when we talk about economic globalization, economic globalization boosts, in some cases, the economic development of a country. And this is related with the world system theory, because as I will address um, later, despite the economic globalization has loads of, of advantages, it, it has also disadvantages in the sense that also underdeveloped countries are always exploited in base of reaching um, economic developed countries. Based on this, we can make the claim that globalization boosts economics at a global level, leaving a chance for underdeveloped countries to participate in the global market. So th this means that economic globalization in some aspects will, will, be, will be able to leave the chance to underdeveloped countries to participate, to participate in, the, in the global market. 
we have the case study of Vietnamese farmers. Why Vietnamese farmers? Because um, thanks to the to the international price of products, um, as it, as it is rice, peppers, and lettuce, Vietnamese farmers increase the price of their products, um, generating uh, generating a major profit in, in based of that, which means that their sons could go could attend to school. Um, they had they improved their um, equality in life. And they also improved the the products that they were they, they were producing, allowing them them to be exported in better qualities. All of this because of the international price of um, farm products. Following, we have also negative effects of globalization. Um, first of all, we have the exploitation of developing nations. Why developing nations? Basically, because there is a cheap labor and um, it's, it's cheaper to produce products for developed nations on um, underdeveloped, underdeveloped nations. This is referred in, in different cases. For example, the, the co cocoa child labor in, in, in Congo it's an example of this, since multinational countries are exploiting the cheap labor of an underdeveloped countries. We have also international interdependence. Um, globaliz um, globalizations bring countries to be extremely dependent of each other. This means that they will have an international interdependence in the sense that we'll, they will be dependent of them for supply of food chains. Um, an example of this is the COVID-19 vaccines for which countries were extremely de dependent um, on that internationally. We have Pfizer's that, that was an international supply chain of vaccines that were provided um, by these countries. And in this sense, an international, an incredibly international interdependence was, um, was generated. We also have tax e evasion. That this mean the, why tax evasions? Because developed countries can go to other countries to evade evade certain certain tax. For example, is the case is the case of a U.S. in Mexico. Since many many companies in in U.S. were were taxed for a certain amount of production, they basically went to Mexico, pr pr produced the same, and they weren't taxed. This all re so related with the with the key concept of inequality, since different companies can evade tax and other cannot generate the inequality in this sense. Le and finally, we have the climate change and environmental impacts. This is related with the environmentalism theory, e environmentalism theory. Sorry, that. Um, that talks about that these uh, international um, relations between countries generate extr extreme footprint and also extreme food um, extreme waste since products are are going uh, are going are traveling further um, further dire directions to arrive to a certain country and then hence there is more weight waste and footprints um, generating and environmental impact and contributing to climate change. So for this, we have the case study of night production in Bangladesh. Um, Bangladesh is one of the, is the fourth country that has more textile productions. Um, and it's simple why um, companies like Nike um, not, all, not only Nike, also Puma and Adidas use this country as a means of exploitation. Basically, Gwanda, uh, Bangladesh has the, minim, the minimum wage um, of Asia. So that's why it's cheaper to produce products here um, because it's, um, the workers are literally paid nothing for it. And not only that, the workers are also abused um, child labor is reports in in these textile companies, and they are um, th there's inequality on payment, especially for women workers in in these factories. So, oh. 
And um, now going on to the environmental side of globalization. Uh, environmental globalization is basically the globalization that uh, involves intensifying, deepening, and expansion of global networks, leading to increase in global uniformity and connectedness in regular environmental management practices, which is a very long phrase that doesn't make a lot of sense. So environmental globalization is basically when people go together so they can implement environmental policies. This is mostly seen as environmental treaties and international cooperation, which is aligned with the liberalism theory. However, this is not as simple as it might look, because it has two sides of it as everything. It can be perceived as either the salvation of the planet and the best thing that we can do, or it can be seen as an attack on sovereignty. Uh, many countries have different perspectives on the, the environmental globalization because it may affect them in different ways depending on where they stand on. Uh, it can be perceived as a salvation of, of the planet because it, uh, this kind of globalization uh, is the one that actively contributes to help the environment and protect it from the pollution and all of the detrimental effects of, uh, let's say, corporations or extractivism, among other things. However, it can also be perceived as an attack on sovereignty because it has a big, big factor on international cooperation and liberalism. The way the non-state uh, organizations and entities uh, affect states is very clear here because some uh, treaties or some organizations such as the UN uh, may have binding treaties or some decisions that may affect the sovereignty of a country. For example, um, we, in 1998, there was the Forest Treaty, which some countries didn't want to sign because they felt as if uh, this treaty in particular was affecting them on a way that wouldn't affect the uh, global north, which is the US, China, etc. So we can see, for example, the Paris Agreement case study, which is one of the most well-known ones uh, that happened in the last decade. Uh, Paris Agreement it took place uh, about five years ago, six years ago, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and its main purpose was to achieve uh, the goal of not reaching uh, the increase of two, two, two degrees Celsius, thank you very much, uh, before the beginning of 22 century. Uh, and we can see that this, is, uh, this was a landmark because two particular things. First, because of the international collaboration. Uh, again, liberalism, United Nations, and the international cooperation of 194 parties, which is 193 states plus the European Union. And this is very important because it is not only people saying that they're going to do something, but actually getting into a binding agreement, which is the next point. However, the actual question arises here. How actually binding is it? We cannot be totally sure. Because the committee, the committee that was established to make it binding is a committee that is transparent, but is non-adversarial and non-punitive. This means that they are not actually going to enforce this with a, a punishment or something that is going to happen to them if they don't accomplish it. Uh, most things that will happen are recommendations and official documents and uh, verbal warning, so to say. Something that even if it is uh, very notorious for calling the attention onto the matter is not actually doing something to enforce it actually. So it is a bit complicated to get to know how actually binding is it. Nonetheless, there is still uh, to be noticed that this agreement, Paris Agreement, was successful to a certain degree. Before Paris Agreement 2015, uh, the, the estimate for the increase of degrees would have, was 3.5 degrees Celsius. However, in 2020, it got reduced to 2.9. Again, these kind of treaties are very complicated to be measured on the way of how effective they are, because we can see uh, the actual status on how they have happened and the effect that they have had now, but we cannot actually measure what would have happened if they were not there. So even if it is not so much, it is only 0 0.6 degrees Celsius, we can see that some change is happening. Nonetheless, some experts believe that it is not enough and the trends nowadays are not going to be sufficient for the to reach the goal then some countries are going to come on here but what about our sovereignty and it is a very important matter as well because of course uh, countries want to maintain their sovereignty and want to as well think about their own interests because even if it is important to, uh, to have into consideration the environment and things that are going to happen in a couple of decades it is also important for countries to uh, take notice of their current status and what is actually happening to them on the present moment. And then we have the Montreal Protocol case study. And this is very interesting, particularly because uh, 
this Mon the Montreal Protocol, which is to reduce the ozone uh, layer contaminants, uh, has a particular clause which is uh, very different to many others, and it indicates that even if some countries are not ratifying it, uh, if two thirds of the countries agree to a change, two, ter two thirds of the parties agree to change something, and let's say uh, apply some punishments or apply some rules, uh, then the it is applied to everyone. Only with two thirds of the votes, uh, it is it becomes it can become binding to everyone because Montreal Protocol is binding per se. So one third of the countries or the parties signatories to this agreement may be in disagreement with something that is changed or some punishment that is going to be enforced. However, because of the vote, it is going to be enforced on them without caring about their sovereignty because in the first place they sign it. However, uh, that is a matter, that is a problem. So some countries don't want to enter binding agreements because they are afraid that in the future some more stuff is going to be added on, upon that and that is going to be reducing their sovereignty again and again and again. So yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Awesome. So um, often in Muki as well, we all, all often have this conversation if political, uh, if politics as per se is relevant to economics or maybe is economics more important than politics or vice versa. So um, I'm going to talk about something similar, but the political aspect of how economies can be impacted by politics or how politics is really being impacted by the um, economics in terms of globalization. So um According to IB, there are two particular perspectives about global uh, political globalization or maybe how you can, uh, the perspectives or maybe however you can define political globalization. So first one is, of course, like the one which Aaron also mentioned, how um, the interactions and cooperations that exist between countries within the world. Um, it also relates upon the political influence within countries. It also means that how countries are coming together to do agreements like Paris Agreement or maybe the monetary collateral. So a lot of agreements being done within countries which have some political influence. Uh, and the other one is, of course, the rise in the influence of IGOs and how NGOs has came into power and how this particular idea of IGOs and NGOs really impact the countries these days. Um, one of the biggest example of uh, the NGOs and IGOs could be uh, maybe UN or maybe uh, uh, organizations like Red Cross, which really watch out for whatever is happening around the world. Um, then there's uh, the idea of global, uh, the political globalization also ties with the liberal perspective of how um, countries are better off when they are coming together instead of being individual because as we say that when things when there are more number of people or maybe more number of countries together the power multiplies while when there is only one individual involved within the process automatically because that person don't have a lot of regulation over the idea or over the particular problem the power reduces so this goes with the same idea um, then I want to talk about how political globalization also have several impacts so one of the very first stakeholders as the citizens of any country. So it also gives a greater access for 